in the past 24 hours but also just in the past like 72 hours to 100 hours past few days the Biden administration has been getting a lot of pressure from pro-Ukraine and fledglingly pro-Ukraine individuals and some individuals that wouldn't even consider pro-Ukraine that are just like through political convenience in a position where they are supporting Ukraine. Um, point is though, they're getting a lot of pressure from a lot of people on the Biden administration policy of restricting American weapons to use only within internationally recognized Ukrainian territory, meaning occupied Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, and Crimea. This would mean that, for example, the recent longer range attack shipments that while the M39 blocks go 150 kilometers, these newer ones can go seemingly somewhat over 200 kilometers and have been used to target training bases in Luhansk, have been used to target command posts, have been used to target uh, air defense in Crimea and uh, the bases for Southern Command and all sorts of stuff. That can only be used in Ukraine, what is internationally recognized as Ukrainian territory, that cannot be used within Russia proper. Now, why is this restriction in place and what has the effect been? Let's go through this quickly. So the reason why the restriction is in place is because some people like Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, as uh, as an example, are concerned that the use of American weapons on Russia proper to target, say, oil refineries, which occurring according to the public facing position of the United States government, they are currently not too in favor of. Uh, this could lead to a confrontation between the United States and Russia or NATO and Russia and be a potential point of escalation. Now, this is not that different than the uh, objections to sending F-16s at the start of the war or the M uh, uh, or the MiG-30 uh, or the MiG-29 or the MiG transfer program that was being advocated for with Poland at the start of the war or the Western tank shipments that were talked about at the, uh, earlier on in the war or attack with sending Western tanks. That was a potential escalation that could lead to confrontation when it came to sending attack That was a potential point of escalation that could lead to confrontation when it came to sending all sorts of equipment to uh, cluster munitions that was talked about as even sometimes, even though it was talked more from a humanitarian perspective, it was also talked about as a potential point of escalation. All these different things were used as potential points of escalation. And then it never ended up amounting to really much of anything. Now, there's two mindsets you can go about this as to why none of it ended up amounting to anything. The first mindset is that it didn't amount to anything because, well, the Russians didn't have a hard cutoff point to object to and escalate at. If you just send a little bit more aid and then a little bit more aid and then a little bit more aid, there's no big jump than if the Biden administration was to say in March, say, we're going to send jets, we're going to send attack them, we're going to send this. If they said, we're going to send all this at the same time, then Putin would know the point where he has to escalate to maximum capacity to try to deter. Whereas if it's just a slow escalation, there's no point where Putin could throw up his arms and say, if you go any further, I'll blow up the world. Because there's no because if if he says that at a lower point, it degrades the trustworthiness or the credibility of the claim. And it also means that he can't use stronger leverage for higher levels of escalation. Because then if we call their bluff. Well, then obviously that's going to be a problem. So he would want to only use that at a big point of escalation. And so if you keep it slow, that means it's harder for the uh, for the Russians to escalate at any point on top of all of the other in, uh, inherent disincentives from trying to escalate to the nuclear level. On the other hand. It could be just because the Russians are bluffing, they're banging their chest because they've got no other option. So they're basically playing global suicide, risking global suicide in order to try to salvage their war, uh, but are not being serious about it. And they've just been bluffing. And every time they back down or a red line is crossed and nothing happens, that's just more evidence of them bluffing. Now, which one you believe in, I'll leave to the viewer's discretion. Whether you believe in a combination of both of them, one, the other, it is what it is. The Biden administration still holds this position, but recently Anthony Blinken had a meeting with a Ukrainian official where he said that the Ukrainians have the right to determine how to use American provided munitions 
um, at the end of the day, but America does not endorse the use of that on Russian territory. And some people, me included, thought that that could be an indication of a shift on American policy. Because, hey, recently the United Kingdom said that the Storm Shadows and other British weapons could be used inside Russia proper. So maybe after that push and nudge, because it was the British who first broke the mold when it came to the transfer of uh, of uh, Western tanks. They were the first ones to break the mold when it came to long-range weapons with the Storm Shadows. Maybe they're going to be the first to break the mold when it comes to striking Russia proper. Um, so people started to, you know, get really excited. I got a little excited, but I told people to wait and see, of course. And then the administration came out and clarified and said, no, 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 no. Uh, we did not mean that they could use it however they want. Uh, they still are not allowed to use Western weapons or specifically American weapons. And some rumors say that they're even applying the standard to weapons not sent by the United States, but also sent by the United Kingdom and other parties as well from being used in Russia proper. But after that like blip on the radar, after that attention that was brought to it, after that statement from Anthony Blinken that made it look like he was endorsing the use of Western weapons on Russia proper, after uh, there being a lot of noise from Zelensky on this issue again, as he talks about it quite openly, uh, as he's trying to get the Biden administration to move on the use of attackums on Russia, since he's now got them to finally send the attackums. Uh, now, there's also, of course, the Kharkiv counteroffensive or the Kharkiv offensive that the Russians took uh, took place, where the Ukrainians say that they saw the Russians gathering across the border and they could have struck them with attackums, but the restrictions were in place, so they didn't. And that they could have blunted the Russian offensive into locations like Vovachansk, but due to those American restrictions, they were unable to. Now, to be clear, that wouldn't solve all the problems of the Russian offensive in Kharkiv, but it probably would have led to more casualties. It probably could have led to some blunting of the initial offensive. It probably would mean that the Russians would have less, uh, uh, they would have more difficulty with gathering freely on the border without being targeted like their troops were when they were training in the Luhansk region. But all these factors uh, together, all of these brought together, uh, uh, have led to more attention being brought to this issue again. And so in the last 72 hours, but even just the last 24 hours, a bunch of different figures have come forward to try to get the Biden administration to move on this issue. And some of this is coming from somewhat unexpected, uh, unexpected places. Uh, the first is less unexpected. Representative McCall, who has been a big supporter of Ukraine, but is a Republican. He, while speaking to Anthony Blinken in a committee hearing, when he was answering questions to Congress, which we might be watching that later today, just to let you guys know, uh, he was confronted by Representative McCall, who started talking about the gathering of Russian forces across the border for the Kharkiv counteroffensive and pointing out for everyone's knowledge that Congress never put restrictions on American weapons to Ukraine. And it is the Biden administration that is specifically saying that American weapons cannot be used in Russia proper. And he wanted to make this point very clear. So he even brought a visual aid. Ukraine. Um we have a really bad situation going on, as you know. This is a sanctuary zone that the Russians have created. And what they're doing is they're lining up all their artillery uh, and rockets and missiles just across the Ukraine border that they then use to attack the Ukrainians. However, your administration and Jake Sullivan have restricted the arms uh, I like that Jake Sullivan is just known as the softy Ukraine guy. That every single conversation, it's like, oh, escalation. Like that, he, that's just the reputation he's built. And honestly, I wouldn't be that surprised if to some degree it's not deserved. But from everything I've heard, it's at least partially deserved because he was the person on the other end of the conversation when it came to sending the MiGs over to Ukraine near the start of the war and the F-16 Polish transfer program idea that was shot down by the Biden administration at the start of the war. Sullivan have restricted the arms... Uh, use so that Ukraine cannot defend itself and fire back at Russia. That's why I mandated the attackums in the supplemental, the long range, short range, and the high Mars that your administration is tying their hands behind their back. To be clear, though, 
the bill that was eventually passed that Republicans are very proud of because, well, even though it's the same bill as the one before, it did mandate that the president had to send attackums to Ukraine, but that's not even necessarily true. There was an addendum in it that the president might not send attackums if they believe it's not in America's national security interest, meaning that we need those right now, or uh, that they could send whatever attackums they wanted, meaning that Biden could have just sent a bunch of M39 block attackums, 150 kilometer range, not 300 kilometers, which is what the Ukrainians want, or anything that would be, you know, more substantial, more useful to the Ukrainians. They could just give them like just the worst aspects of it. There were again a, a lot of problems with the aid bill, a lot of um, unfulfilled opportunity. But I digress. Your administration is tying their hands behind their back not unlike what you're trying to do in Israel, will you change this policy so Ukraine- Can't Wait, wait, no, can we, hold up. There, we have let our weapons be used in Gaza for decades, for decades. There is no comparison. Our weapons are still being used in Gaza. Israel's interceptors have had very high success rates. We make sure they're always well stocked. It is a bipartisan consensus that they will be well stocked. I mean, there's not even like a question of whether or not we're going to continue to send aid to Israel. It's a question about whether we're going to send a certain type of aid to Israel of a specific type of offensive weapon. So I don't know. I don't like the comparison, but whatever. I'm going to stop interrupting McCall. I'm being rude. Not unlike what you're trying to do in Israel, will you change this policy so Ukraine can fight without one hand tied behind its back? Well, as you know, we rallied. 50 countries over the last uh, two years to come to Ukraine's defense to provide it with the weapons it needs to defend itself to push back against Russian aggression. When it comes to um, uh, enabling, endorsing uh, attacks outside of Ukraine, uh, that's not something we've done, but Ukraine will have to make and will make its own decisions, and I want to make sure it gets the equipment that it needs well, to Well, you know, Congress got itself. them the equipment, and thank, thank you for implementing that, but Congress did not put restrictions on the use of these weapons, it's it's Jake Sullivan and your administration is true. that has put the restrictions on these weapons. And I talked to them, and this is not, they cannot achieve victory with these restrictions that you, not the Congress, have placed on them. And I hope you'll take that back to the National Security Advisor and the National Security Council uh, and change this policy decision that is very dangerous and damaging to the Ukraine. Ukrainian people. So this is a high-ranking Republican. This is a call out from uh, uh, Biden's right flank of his policy on Ukraine, which we don't hear a lot of anymore. But every once in a while, you do hear it from the pro-Ukraine Republicans. But this is not where it ended. Like I said, there was an attack on Biden over the last 24 hours from many different angles on this. For example, Representative Mike Johnson, who has never been the biggest supporter of Ukraine aid, in fact, the majority of Ukraine aid bills he has voted against in his congressional record, only voting in favor of the immediate after the Russian invasion aid bills, voting against basically every single other provision in favor of Ukraine aid, except for the last package, which he and his team around him delayed for six months, uh, causing much frustration, leading to who knows how many casualties that are simply just due to the fact that we sat on our hands for six months when we could have moved, we could have got the supply sooner. And people can talk about the adjustments between the first bill and the second bill, but those adjustments kept it as basically the same bill with very minor changes that could have been made six months ago. No good justification, bad record on voting for Ukraine. And I would just say, generally speaking, that it's not an issue he's willing to stick out his neck out much for. But as of recent, it seems like he's getting he's gotten pretty scared in certain intelligence meetings that has seemed to change his tone somewhat on this issue. And now we're hearing Mike Johnson trying to go after Joe Biden from his flank on the pro-Ukraine side, saying that it's Joe Biden restricting Ukrainians from using the weapons the way they want to use them meaning that one of the people who were holding up Ukraine aid for the longest time is now criticizing Biden for not allowing the Ukrainians to use that aid as they please. Speaker, could I ask a quick question? Uh, your colleagues from House Intelligence Committee, they just released a statement in which they're calling for administration to allow Ukraine to use American weaponry on the military targets uh, on Russian territory. Would you support that? Because right now they have weapons, but what they have restrictions to use that. I, I think we need to allow Ukraine to prosecute the war and the way they see fit. They have um, 
they need to be able to fight back. And I think uh, us trying to micromanage the effort there is um, is not good policy for us. So this is, this is not good policy for us. High-ranking Republicans going after Biden for it. Mike Johnson going after Biden for it. But it doesn't end there. Here's the U.S. Helsinki Commission going after it. Going after this policy. I'm grateful that President Biden has provided long-range missiles. And this is from just yesterday. Again, so many different angles that he's getting uh, dragged through the mud on this. And this is like the Helsinki Commission leadership just got renewed. In fact, I think the Helsinki Commission just put a few guys from the like the NAFO circle uh, up in there, actually. No joke. But Ukraine must be able to legitimately defend itself from attacks launched from within the borders of the Russian Federation. Right now, as we speak, Russian Air Force is conducting live bomb attacks from Russia's airspace sanctuary on Kharkiv, and it can do so indefinitely. As we must abandon the Russian information line that Russia. By the way, the reason it could do it indefinitely is because they have an endless supply, or practically endless supply, of glide bombs that they can retrofit to throw at these cities that are massive and bring buildings down to their foundation can somehow demand an immunity from being attacked when it's waging an unprovoked war. We need to intelligently tailor our assistance to a specific strategy and plan that will bring victory to Ukraine. So what this is, is they got a bunch of experts and different people together to also condemn the blocking of strikes on Russia proper. And I could do this all day. I could keep showing you clips like this all day. Here's a Lithuanian foreign minister yesterday also calling for Ukraine to be allowed, saying that, and I quote, Ukraine must, and I say must be allowed to strike Russian territory with Western arms. In an interview with French TV station LCI, uh, the, uh, the Lithuanian foreign minister said restrictions such as those imposed by the United States on using long range attack arms missiles inside Russia were a, and I quote, mistake. From the beginning, we have made the mistake of limiting the Ukrainians because it could be seen as an escalation. Uh, Landsberg said that such decisions were dominated by fear of Russia and worries about escalating the conflict beyond Ukraine's borders. The Ukrainians must be allowed to use the equipment provided to them so that they can achieve strategic objectives. They must be able to strike Russian territory, supply lines, and military units preparing to attack Ukraine. Only one side has rules imposed on it. We must abandon these rules that we create. I have seen this getting brought up more and more, but it is true that both Iranian drones and North Korean missiles have been launched at Ukraine proper with little to no repercussions for either state, practically no repercussions for North Korea and very little to no repercussions for the Iranians. And so there is also a question of what standard is being applied for Russia, Iran, North Korea and the rest of Russia's backers versus the standard that we are asking Ukraine to apply to itself, which is not a standard that we're expecting Russia to apply to itself as the larger, more powerful party with more resources, more power, more economic might. And that's the one that doesn't have their hands tied behind their back invading Ukraine. So this shows that the pressure on Biden and on the Biden administration uh, number one, I think is warranted. It's warranted because they are the ones holding back this restriction. It is ultimately Biden's call whether American weapons can be used inside of Russia proper. It is not Congress's fault. It is not Mike Johnson's fault. It is not Marjorie Taylor Greene's fault. It is not the fault of uh, some crazy committee or some MAGA Republicans. It's not a fault of Congress or anyone. It is the fault of the Biden administration's policy. It is their current stance that is continuing to restrict these as we're hearing more rumors about not only continued Russian offensives over into the Kharkiv Oblast as they continue to push uh, down into Ukraine using Russian territory sometimes to stage bombing operations. For example, I was seeing across the border from Russia them doing MLRS rocket strikes into Ukraine gathered together and they're staying over there because they know that they cannot be struck with American weapons. They cannot be struck with attackums. And so since they can't be struck with attackums, they want to stay in Russia because there's a political difference, because they've got that political protection given to them courtesy of, uh, of I mean, I don't want to say Jake Sullivan because I feel like it's a little bit more, it's a little bit of cruel, but at least the combined policy of the Washington, of the current Washington consensus.
whether or not this pressure is going to be enough to move the Biden administration as the United Kingdom moves on this, as we've seen the Biden administration and the United States move on Abrams shipments, as we've seen the move on F-16s, as we've seen the move on sending attackums to begin with. I mean, all of these things were things that could never be sent, never be done, and then they were done. And what I'm hearing is from a lot of people is that, well, just wait and see, we'll get there eventually. And while that's really dandy, that's really nice, the Russians are gathering, uh, reportedly, in the Sumi Oblast right now. So to give you an idea, right now, the Russians are fighting in a bunch of places. They're fighting in Kherson and Krinky. They're fighting down south in Zaporizhia. They're trying to push to take Robotny, which was taken back by the Ukraini Ukrainians during the last counteroffensive. Right here, here's Robotny. Um, they are pushing in the Donetsk region around Evdivka. They are pushing uh, in uh, around uh, around everywhere in the Donetsk region. They are also now pushing in the Kharkiv region. But there is a risk that they're going to push into the Sumi region. So, one second, I have this still in Ukraine, I just realized. In this region, there are reports that Russian troops are gathering on the border here so that, that they can pressure Sumi. Now, why they would do it, whether it would be because they want to capture Sumi, which I don't think is particularly likely, but if the Russians could, they'd capture all of Ukraine. Um, or if it's to try to drag more troops away from the Kharkiv Oblast or to drag more troops away from, you know, Avdivka or Slovansk or Lyman or Sevirsk, or any of these locations that they need troops at right now to stop the Russian advance, um, I don't know. But if the Russians are going to attack in Tsumi, presumably that means at some point they're going to have to gather for attacks across the border. And when they gather for attacks across the border, and if this restriction is still in place, then the same thing that happened during the start of the Kharkiv counteroffensive could very well repeat itself in a Russian offensive into the Sumi Oblast, which is the Russians gather across the border, the Russians then cross the border, and then the Russians are not struck with Western munitions in locations uh, across the border where these weapons could be quite effective because of political restrictions, meaning their offensive is not blunted, meaning that the Russians are attacking basically at full capacity, and that the Russians are not disoriented. There's no chaos being rained upon the offensive from above. And this was a problem for Kharkiv, and I have no reason to believe that it wouldn't be a problem for Sumi as well. And so I think there is some impetus, and we're hearing more pressure, because either A, the Ukrainian government has called the Lithuanian government, they've called all these people, they've talked to so many people, and they're open with how useful this could be to them to strike these troop formations, or to use it to strike the air bases, which with Russia is terror bombing different locations or bombing different Ukrainian cities. I also think it could be just because, you know, different people have eyeballs and they can see what happened in Kharkiv and they can hear what's happening possibly around Sumy and they can see the Russians extending the line and they want every tool at the disposal of the Ukrainians to hold them back, definitely after six months of delay. Point is, though, either way, the pressure on the Biden administration is increasing. And while the Republicans get a lot of garbage for uh, you know not supporting the Ukrainians, and there's a lot of people that can get fingered for not standing with Ukraine or standing against Ukraine or trying to undermine support for Ukraine, at the end of the day, the Biden administration is what controls the executive branch, and the executive branch is what is determining the policy on what can and cannot be struck with Western weapons. So ultimately, the buck stops with Biden on to why those strikes were not done in Belgorod. And the buck will also stop with Biden if those strikes are not done, uh, if there is an attack into the Sumi Oblast or if this policy stays going into the future. Do you think the Nazis were worried about sanctions, lol? Um, probably not.